I'm CISSP. I'm also a senior analyst at Makana. We're a device startup in San Francisco, a device um, security startup. And our claim to fame is a small crypto library in which um, we've been uh, government certified. And so we work on over 2,000 combinations of OS and chipsets. And some of these combinations are FIPS 140-2 uh, level one certified. Um, I'm also the author, as Bart pointed out, of When Gadgets Betray Us. I'm a security blogger at Forbes.com. I'm a contributing editor at PC World Magazine. And if any of you are sticking around for DEF CON later this week, um, there's a movie being shown on Friday night at 8 o'clock. It's called Code 2600. And Jeff Moss, uh, Bruce Schneier, uh, Jennifer Granick, um, Marcus Raynham, and a bunch of others, including me, are in this documentary. I encourage you to check it out. It's about the history of hacking. So. When Gadgets Betray Us, uh, I wrote this book as a mainstream discussion of device security. So I'm not going to talk about fuzzing. We're going to talk a little bit about device security. But I think you'll see that there's some parallels going on here as well. So there are a lot of um, gadgets that we take for granted. And I'm not going to go through the history of computing. You guys know it very well. But at Makana, we believe we're in the third era. And that is all those Internet of Things items that connect to the Internet. And a lot of them, I think, escape notice because they're so prevalent in our day-to-day -day lives. So when we think about devices, we tend to focus on that top part of the iceberg, the things that we see, um, you know, the mobile phones and, and the smart grid devices. But when you drill down, you start getting into some other things, like what about the printers in your office? and things like that. They're starting to connect to the internet. They're addressable. And so they become problematic because they have vulnerabilities and those vulnerabilities can be exploited. And you can use them to survey your network. You can do a lot of things with the devices that are in our midst. And so I want to encourage a discussion about device security. So every industry is affected. It's not just the uh, consumer electronics, but it's also medical. Uh, there are a lot of medical devices that can be hacked today. There are a lot of devices that are in um, street lights and so forth that can also be addressed over the internet and hacked. Now these might not th seem to be problems today, but at some point somebody's going to start messing around with these and cause a lot of problems. Traffic could get delayed, pacemakers could stop working, and then we're going to be stuck. So we had 20 years to work out some of the problems in the PC, in the personal computing era. And that time, we had a lot of ego-boosting early viruses that were out there. They were written just for the heck of it and didn't do a lot of serious damage. But as you see, as we move into the latter half of the last um, few years, there was an exponential jump because people started to realize that there was some monetary value in doing what they were doing. Now, one thing we did in the PC era was we got people educated. Firewalls trickled down from big government institutions through enterprises down to desktop and laptop computers. Antivirus became fairly common. With device security, this is all going to change because basically the landscape is a little bit different. First of all, we have something that is shortening the time that we have to worry about this problem. We had 20 years to worry about PCs. We have Moore's Law working against us here. Devices are getting smaller, and they're getting much more um, robust in what they can do. And so we figure we have about 18 months that, where we got to get really serious about all those devices out there. And just to give you some scale, um, there are five times as many devices that connect to the Internet as there are PCs and laptops. So we're kind of losing the battle right now. If there's five billion devices out there that connect today, in three to five years, there's going to be 20 billion devices out there. And a lot of them have been designed without security. And a lot of them can't necessarily import security. So we're going to have to make some decisions going forward. So there's a couple difference. In the PC era, we had hundreds of millions of computers to secure. In the device era, as I just mentioned, we have tens of billions. Uh, connectivity. It was intermittent with the PC. You had your dial-up. You had uh, laptops that weren't always connected. With the uh, device era, we have always on. It's expected that these devices are always communicating. And in some cases, they're single purpose devices. Like if there are monitors out in the field for like a SCADA network for a utility, all they're doing is sending back little bursts of data. And those devices are designed to work in the field for sometimes five to 20 years. In the PC era, we were only thinking in terms of two to three years, and then you'd go buy a new computer. 
So there are some fundamental differences, and yet all of those differences involve security. We need to be thinking from the security side, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So the threat landscape has also changed. As I indicated, 20 years ago, there was a lot of ego in why people attack things. It was a lot of fun to have your name or have your virus's name up there in the newspapers. And then it became you know, revenge, insiders trying to get back at their big corporate employers, stealing data that embarrassed them. And then you had monetary game, all the scams and stuff that are going on. And then it started getting serious. And this was in the last four years or so where we saw industrial espionage going on, data being stole, plans being stole from companies overseas and so forth. And now within the last year, we're learning about national security issues whether or not governments were involved in creating Stuxnet and Flame and maybe other viruses that we haven't yet discovered. So it's starting to get more and more serious. This is still within the PC realm, and we, not, we now have to scale that out to all these devices. What's going to happen in the device realm? So in many cases, we have a threat model. And in many cases, those threat models are based on something we know. I'm a CIS coming at you from the left, the right, up, down. They're attacking you from all different angles. IT person, you have 10 things that you worry about at your company, okay? That's based on stuff that you've been trained or that you know firsthand are out there. Well, guess what? The bad guys don't have that training and they don't have that experience. They're coming at you from the left, the right, up, down. They're attacking you from all different angles. It's a dirty little secret. A lot of vendors are not talking about the vulnerabilities that they know in their uh, devices. Um, they have little ability to defend themselves right now, for that matter. Um, meanwhile, researchers are ramping it up. You see, this at, you see this at Black Hat and at DEF CON and other conferences such as this, where researchers come forward with the data that they have. They're looking at these problems, even if the vendors aren't admitting that they're there. And then the device manufacturers are still being silent, and I'll give you a couple examples. So how do I know this? These are pretty provocative claims to be making. Last year, uh, Makana and EE Times partnered to do a survey. They surveyed 900 embedded security engineers, and they found that 25% of them knew of vulnerabilities within their products. But these are vulnerabilities that were not disclosed to the public, nor were they being patched by the vendor. So you have a one in four chance of purchasing a device that may have a known vulnerability within it. And then 40% of them, or nearly 40% of them, said that they didn't have the resources to address the problem once they found the problem. They didn't have the training or they didn't have the resource library that they could draw upon to correct the errors. But the threats are real. I write a daily blog for Makana called The Vice Line, and a year ago I was writing one story a day. Now I'm writing three stories a day, and I focus exclusively on embedded security device security. So it's starting to ratchet up. So what are some examples from my book? Um, digital TVs. Probably take that for granted. They connect to the internet. So two years ago, Makana did a penetration test of a very popular digital TV. We did not name the brand, but we believed it to be generic, that the problems that we found in that brand was probably true in other brands as well. And what we found was the device did not authenticate any updates that were passed over the internet. It just accepted whatever was there. And then second of all, data that was stored on the TV was stored in the clear. And data that was transmitted back and forth, also in the clear. So you might be saying, well, it's my digital TV. I really don't care what's going to be on there. Well, actually you do. If you've got your Picasa photo album on there, it knows your password now if somebody were to look in. Um, your Netflix account, et cetera, et cetera. Those things were stored in the clear and were not protected. I'll give you another example with updates. Uh, two researchers at Columbia University last year reported that um, HP did not authenticate its updates that were being passed out. HP installs a little client on your desktop or your laptop that connects to the printer. So every time that there's an update from the vendor, it passes through your, your desktop or laptop to the printer. And most of us just go ahead and accept it. New update, great, I'll install it, no problem. Well, these researchers found that it had to be in a certain proprietary format but if they could spoof that, they could make it do anything that they wanted to do. And what caught the media's headline was this. They said that they could turn on the fuser, which is the part of the printer that dries the ink, 
and they could make it so that it would get so hot that it would set the paper on fire, potentially even the printer. Turns out that that was inaccurate. What they, what they actually said, well, what, what actually was going on, excuse me, was HP um, fuser bars have a governor in it, and so they would never ever get that hot, no matter what the code told them to do. They turn it off. And HP very wisely fired back a press release saying that that was the case. What HP did not address, however, was the update problem and the fact that all you had to do was have code in a particular proprietary format and the printer would accept it. it didn't authenticate the origin of it. And so I think that's a problem. And we see that um, possibly with other printers as well. But I think that this is a larger issue where there's a bit of a smoke screen going on. This is that you know, code of silence that I mentioned earlier with some of the vendors. They don't know how to respond when there's a vulnerability because they're device manufacturers. And in the software industry, we've had this for 20 some years. Microsoft certainly went through growing pains around discoveries of vulnerabilities and I think has dealt with them fairly well these days. But the device manufacturers, they're all new to this and they're discovering what it is to be in the spotlight. Some of the common excuses I get back from the vendors when we find vulnerabilities are it requires the resources of a small nation state. I love that one. Uh, they still believe that it would take a Manhattan project to basically hack their device. And that's certainly not the case. And we'll find some examples of that in a moment. Um, the other is it requires elite programming skills, as if their product was somehow coded in a uber language that we haven't all been exposed to before. And certainly fuzzing can break some of this. Uh, all you have to do is just throw some code at something and you can find ways in which it'll break. And lastly, why would you hack this? Why would you attack this? Okay, well, if you're somebody like Jay Radcliffe, you're curious. Jay is a colleague of mine, and last year at Black Hat and DEF CON, he hacked his uh, insulin pump. And for Jay, this was a very personal thing. Uh, he needs it to, uh, to, to live. He's a type 1 diabetic, and he depends on this device. But he wondered what happens if the communication between the glucose meter and the pump gets interrupted. And with a few parts that he picked up here and there and a little bit of programming and a couple phone calls to various manufacturers, he was able to create ways in which he could interrupt that flow. In other words, he created a denial of service upon it himself. So that's a medical device. This was no nation state. This was one guy working literally at his coffee table at home. So here's another example, and this is from my book. Radko Susik, you probably never heard this name before and there's no reason for you to have. He's a street criminal on the streets of Prague, or at least he was until he was arrested in 2006. From the age of eight, he would go around and he would literally cut the wires on expensive cars and hotwire them to start them up. He would steal cars off the street. 2006, he was arrested for stealing 150 luxury cars in Prague. We know this because his laptop told us how. It told, him, told us that he did. How was he using his laptop? Well, he was able to simulate the key fob command and wirelessly communicate with the automobile to get it to open up its doors and to turn on its ignition. It had a keyless entry and keyless ignition. So back in 2006 and certainly before, uh, keyless entry and ignition systems were based on basically a 64-bit encryption scheme. Now, Back in 1990, when the auto manufacturers started adopting these things, they thought, this is great. There's a trillion possible key codes here. This is wonderful. We're never going to run out. Well, what did they do? They got a little arrogant with what they were doing. They said, a trillion? Great. This is Ford. This is Hyundai. This is Kia. They broke it up into little chunks. So now, if you want to brute force it, you only have to brute force the chunk that you're interested in. And remember I talked about a small nation state? called organized crime. So you have somebody sitting there literally 9 to 5, Monday through Friday, trying to figure out what the codes are for BMW or Mercedes. And then they come up with an algorithm that always generates these codes, and they put it up on the internet, and somebody like Radko Susik, who's never taken a programming course in his life, downloads it and puts it on a stolen laptop, which is now, because of Moore's Law, very fast, and he's able to brute force this in about 20 minutes because he knows the name, he knows the brand of the car that he's going after and he's got the algorithm to go after it. So the auto manufacturers are like, oh, problem, we can solve it. We're gonna do code hopping. We're not gonna be going from key to key to key, we're gonna jump around randomly. 
No good. All you need are a couple different examples, and then you can actually generate the randomness as well. So now he's got a second program that allows him to anticipate what the next code is going to be when he tries to get into the keyless in ent entry and keyless ignition. Computerized cars. If you're not stealing the car, what else can you do? There are up to 70 different discrete electrical systems in cars, and it's literally balkanized. There's no you know, operating system that governs them all. There's no platform, really. There's 70 different discrete systems. You can actually have a lot of fun with this. Um, there's a researcher at the University of California, Santa Barbara, who worked with um, University of Washington, his name's Stephen Savage. And what he did was he plugged his laptop into the uh, RS-232 port, which is under every steering column in every car produced after about 2000. And what this port is used for, it's a diagnostic port. This is the port that allows your, man, your um, mechanic down the street to get the same codes that your um, vehicle um, dealership uses to diagnose the problems with your car. So he was able to tap into that and he was able to send malicious code to the car. And using fuzzing, he was able to do things like randomly fire the brakes on the, on the anti-lock brake system. The anti-lock brake system is supposed to work in conjunction with each other to keep your car from spinning out of control. He was able to find the code that made you know, the, the driver's side front brake fire randomly as opposed to the rest of them. Or turn on and off the lights in the car. Or turn up the music very, very loud on your infotainment system. Okay, one thing that he had here was um, it's wireless. So not only was he physically plugged into this port, but he could then communicate wirelessly with the laptop in the car from another car. And I'll get to that in a moment. This is one of my favorite um, hacks that he did. He was able to make the car look as though it was going 140 miles per hour. The only problem is the car was still in park. So when we talk about gadgets betraying us, this is a very scary scenario if you're driving down the freeway at 60 miles an hour and you don't have trust in what your display is telling you about your car. So they conducted live road tests up outside of Tacoma, Washington. They used an abandoned airfield and they were able to communicate with two cars driving in parallel. So you can imagine the scenario where you know, it's literally out of a movie where two cars are side by side and one car is hacking the other. And that other car is weaving out of control because the driver has no control over it. It's this very scary scenario because it may not be your car that's being attacked. It might be the car next to you that's going to crash into you at any moment. Um, the other thing that they found was there are some wireless things within the car that they could access. So you don't need to plug into that RS-232 port anymore. There's something called the Tire Pressure Monitoring System, TPMS, and it uses wireless because the wheel is spinning at so many thousand RPMs, you can't have a wired system. They were able to tap into that. Now, what they were able to do was limited. They were able to get the dashboard light to go on and off, saying that the TPMS needs service, but that's all they could do at the moment. They think that they could go further with that. And further, what they've been able to do with the infotainment system is really scary. They've been able to take an MP3 file and stick malicious code into it and then use Bluetooth to send it to the stereo system, and now the car is infected. So you can imagine a scenario where somebody downloads a very popular song that's compromised, and then they use it to hack their car, basically, or, or you know, have problems with their car afterwards. So fortunately, the automobile industry is mature. They've been through seat belts. They've been through anti-smog stuff before. They know what happens when the government gets involved. So they're proactive here. They're actually talking to Dr. Savage and they're actually working with researchers to find out the various ways in which people can hack into the 70 plus electrical systems in their cars and I'm very encouraged. Here's an example, Ford. Ford partnered with Microsoft to create something called Sync, which is what they use for their infotainment system in, in Ford vehicles. Version one is out on the road. They need to get that updated. They've got 30,000 plus cars. Now the auto industry before has operated under the assumption that they're just gonna do a recall and have everybody go back to the manufacturer. But for a software update, no, no, no. So they're thinking outside the box. They're very proactive and I actually like this. They're telling the owners of those cars to go online and download onto a USB the new version of the firmware for the sync system for their car. Good, so you do that, you go out to your car, here's the bummer part. You have to turn on the engine, and in some cases it can take up to an hour. Hmm, not very good gas mileage there. The other part of the problem is you have to take that USB port when you're done back to your computer and upload the results. 
Ford needs to know that you accomplished the update so the next time they push it out, they don't give you that update plus the new update. They know that you're already good for version one. So I think there's gonna be a failure rate here that's gonna be fairly high. I don't think people are used to that. It also begs the scenario that down the road, we might have, just as we have Patch Tuesdays, we might have Patch Saturdays where you walk around your house and you update the firmware on your TV. You update the firmware on your uh, washer dryer. You update the firmware on your car. And so this is gonna be a very interesting future if that's something we're gonna to have to do. Now, one thing I didn't talk about a lot was mobile security. It's sort of the elephant in the room. It's sort of obvious. We all get it. Mobile smartphones in particular are mini computers. Um, and this is something that's scaring the enterprise to death because they don't know how to handle it. Everybody wants to bring your own device to work and people are not used to it. One way around that is to stop thinking about the device and focus on the application. If you can secure the application and make that the endpoint, that may be the solution that we're looking for. And so by having a new employee come into work on Monday and download from your enterprise app store the secure apps that the IT department wants you to use, then when that employee leaves the company, the IT department can just terminate those or withdraw them if necessary. So why am I, where am I getting these ideas from? The Department of Defense. They've moved from a model where they had the best stuff first to recognizing that they're falling way behind the consumers. So they've moved to something called COTS, which is consumer off-the-shelf technology. They're allowing people to go and buy their phones, their Androids, their iOSs themselves, and they're using this idea of the app as endpoint and wrapping the app securely. They're also using uh, secure um, voice over IP as well. So again, these are consumer phones that are being made to work in a very secure environment. And I know this because my company is helping to do some of this. So for the rest of us, there are going to be some new regulations coming. Uh, and I just point to one here. There's several in Congress, but there's the Cybersecurity Act of 2012. And one of the things it says is it allows DHS to come up with a baseline security, a baseline security for all of us to, to basically work off of. With any baseline, I used to work in the financial services space, any baseline, it's the lowest possible level and we need to accept that. But I know some people think, oh, that's all I need to be in order to be compliant. Well, no, it's, you can do better, believe me. But it, it's a start. And companies that are wrongly accused of not being in compliance will have the ability to uh, appeal. This, of course, is going to create a cottage industry of auditors that are going to go around and make sure that you meet the DHS requirements, but that's okay. There's also the provision in there that you can self-comply, uh, and that's something that PCI has in it. So why tackle device security? The department, the, basically the market is demanding it. We all love the bling bling. We all love our gadgets. I love gadgets. I'm not a Luddite. I, I really do like that. Um, then whoever does this first is going to be known as being the producer of secure products and you're going to reap the windfalls of that. You're unlikely to be hacked. Hopefully you're unlikely to be hacked. So there's a reduction in cost. If you can build it in at the beginning, you can save a lot of money. IOActive has estimated that it costs 60 times more to bolt on security after the fact. Uh, lost revenue, brand equity, if you're hacked or even there's a suspicion of it, your company suffers. I'll point back to Toyota who had a problem with uh, or perceived problem with brakes and accelerator a few years ago, about the time I was writing the book, 2010. They were vindicated by something called a black box that's in every single car that's been produced after 2001 in the United States. Most of us don't realize it's there, but in crashes it's been used to investigate the cause of the crash and Toyota went back and looked at all the black box data and found that it wasn't their software code that was causing the problem, it was user error. But nonetheless, they lost revenue in the summer of 2010 because there was this perception and people just were not buying their products. And then, do you want to be in the driver's seat or do you want to take a passive role? Because if industry doesn't start regulating itself and doesn't start addressing some of these things, government's going to step in and do it for us. So there are some challenges. I mentioned update Saturday, and I was joking about it, but there is another solution, and that is over the air. Why aren't we doing more of that? We've had the technology for a while. We can do secure, encrypted communication with our devices, and those devices can also authenticate by digitally signing the updates. We can recognize that that is really meant for the device and not for some other device, or it wasn't spoofed. Um, rethink the chip. Uh, I talked to a company in San Francisco called 
um, cryptography research a lot. And one of the things that they're advocating is taking some of the space on these new smaller Moore's Law chips and dedicating some of the processors on those chips just to security, move the security domain into a protected space. And that way you've got security built into the chip and there's no more excuses for these devices to be out in the field without adequate security. And then lastly, train your staff. Uh, device security is new. It's not covered under the CISSP exam yet, but um, there are training programs that are coming about and just educate yourself on what it needs what needs to be done to, to be part of the solution. Uh, in summary, the Internet of Things targets are diverse. We don't have a homogenous operating system to go after. It's no longer Windows that we're targeting. You have a bunch of different variations based on OS and chips. Um, the threats are very real. They're becoming more and more real every day. Uh, you can avoid the pain by acting now and building it in rather than bolting it on later. And lastly, um, you can create and follow a security software roadmap, um, secure software development life cycles. There are a bunch of them out there. Uh, I recommend one written by Gary McGraw called BSIM. It's free, it's a framework, and it can be used on any system, and it's based on the best practices from more than 30 companies. Um, and then you can overcome physical design changes if you're in that space and can build better chips, do so. Lastly, think outside the box. Okay, so why wait for an attack? Don't wait until you're threatened or hacked. Take the lead. So um, have time for a few questions. Otherwise, you can email me at that address, and I'd be happy to entertain your, your thoughts and suggestions. All right. Thank you very much for your time.